Martyr Monday. Today we hear about Perpetua of Carthage, who died age 22 in the year 204. Chapter 1. I don't know if you guys can hear the rain, but it looks like it's starting to turn to hail out there. Anyhow, we have Martyr Monday and the amazing story of Perpetua of Carthage. For a little background, we want to remember that for the first 300 years of Christianity's existence, it was illegal uh, to be a Christian. But that illegality was not always persecuted, at least with the same level of intensity at every place and in every time. But at this era, in the year of our Lord, 202 to 205, there on Carthage, the north tip of Africa, it was in fact illegal to be a Christian. And to enroll as a Christian, to enroll as a catechumenate, that is someone studying the catechism, preparing for baptism and the Lord's Supper, was also illegal. Well, in the midst of this, uh, there is Perpetua, who was 22 years old. She was a wife and a mother of a, of a newborn baby. She had a father and a mother who were noble, so they were well-to-do, uh, a rich and free family. And Perpetua was well-educated, both in Latin and in Greek. She knew how to read and write. And in fact, we know of uh, the, some of the things that happened to her in prison because she wrote them down, and by all cases, the attestation uh, says that the, these are truly written by her uh, and that they were uh, authentic documents. Perpetua had two brothers, and her and one of her brothers enrolled as catechumens, much to the great dismay of her family, most especially her father, who tried any number of times, both as she was enrolling as a catechumenate and then also as she was going to her trial and then going to her death, to try to dissuade her from being a Christian. I'll tell you the story of what she said to her father at the end. Chapter 2 Perpetua and maybe a dozen other catechumens, I can't sort out exactly how many they were. Some are named in the story. Uh, we have the narrative probably from Tertullian, edited by Tertullian, but um, coming even from a hundred years before. And maybe there's a dozen other catechumen, and some are named, and I'll tell the story of some of them in future Martyr Mondays. But uh, Perpetua, Felicitas, Saturnus, and a number of the others who were enrolled were then immediately arrested, and they were thrown in jail, and in fact, like a dungeon. She said, I'd never experienced such oppressive darkness and heat. And so for a few days, maybe a week, they are in this very oppressive dungeon. And it's in this first wave of her imprisonment that she has a dream. And she tells of this dream that in the dream there was a thin bronze ladder that led from earth up to heaven. And all the way up the ladder there were instruments of death. There were swords and, and saws and knives where if you weren't paying it close attention to how you were going, you would get cut open. But on the bottom, coiled around the bottom of the ladder was a gigantic snake, a serpent. And all those who were in prison were gathered around the base of the ladder. And they knew, you know how you know things in a dream, you kind of know what you're supposed to do? They knew in this dream that they were supposed to climb up the ladder, but all of them were afraid because the serpent was there coiled around the base of the ladder. And so Perpetua, though, knowing she had to climb the ladder and knowing that she would go to heaven through her death, went first. And while the snake went to strike her, she stepped on the head of the snake and used his head as the first rung of the ladder and then climbed up the ladder. Uh, she told that dream to her brother the next day, and he says, Your trial will end in death. Chapter 3 Now before we go much farther, what are we supposed to make of these dreams of Perpetua and the other the other martyrs who are also having dreams in prison. I don't know, but I, I think we want to remember that both with the histories of the martyrs and their dreams and the histories of the miracles and, and so forth, that, that there is probably a lot of legend mixed in with the history. Uh, now, this is not biblical history, uh, so it doesn't have the promise that the Bible does, that, that it comes to us inerrant and infallible and, in fact, protected by God himself uh, from errors. 
So, could some of these accounts have been wrong? Surely. And are there superstitions weaved in and out? Probably. Uh, did these dreams happen? Maybe so. Uh, did God necessarily give them the dreams? No. Uh, maybe. We don't know. But we want to look at them and ask, are they helpful? Are they helpful for us? Are they helpful in strengthening our faith? Are they helpful in informing us of the struggles that these martyrs were going through so that we can also imitate their faith uh, and their love? I think in this case, they are. Paul says in the end of Romans, Romans chapter 16, that the Lord will crush the devil under our feet. So that this dream that Perpetua has of stepping on the serpent's head as the first rung of the ladder confirms or um, matches up with what the Bible teaches in that place. Chapter 4 Perpetua is brought to trial and she stands before the governor and unlike a lot of the martyr stories where we have the testimony of the martyrs there to the judge, the main feature that Perpetua tells us of is that her father saw her going to trial and fell down at her feet and begged her, begged her uh, with tears to not go through with this, to say Caesar is Lord, Lord Caesar, to offer the pinch of incense and to be let out of prison, to go back to her family, to be go back to her, uh, her child. Uh, but Perpetua, even though she also was moved to tears by the uh, compelling of her father, she remained steadfast and confessed Christ when they and was judged guilty. So they went back to prison to await martyrdom, but in this second imprisonment, things were much lighter. That's when Perpetual was given the paper and pen so she could write these things down. Her baby was also brought to her so she could nurse her baby and help take care of the baby. And they awaited for some days, maybe for some weeks, uh, until the games would come and they would have the animal exhibitions where the martyrs would be put forth and the wild animals would be let loose on them. Chapter 5 The day before the games, Perpetua has another dream. And she dreams that uh, it, in the dream there is a, uh, a man, the bishop, the deacon, Pomponius, who was a, perhaps a pastor in the church, comes and uh, knocks vehemently at her door and says, Perpetua, we're waiting for you. And he takes her by the hand and, and walks her through the city until they come at last into the amphitheater where she's to be presented as a martyr. And interestingly enough, Perpetua says, I know I was to be presented to the beasts, but when I got into the amphitheater, it was filled with people. But there was no beasts there, but rather gladiators. And in the midst of the gladiator, a particular Egyptian gladiator who stood taller, she says, than the entire amphitheater. Can you imagine it? This 50, 60 foot Egyptian gladiator that she is to face. And the assistants all come to her and they start to prepare her like she is a male soldier and dress her in armor so that she can go and she understands that she is to fight like a gladiator against this giant Egyptian beast. And so they begin to fight and they begin to beat on each other. And she writes in the dream that the Egyptian gladiator went for her feet, but she stuck her heel also in her head and that he was able, she was able to continue to beat on him even though she wasn't even any longer on the ground. She was continuing to beat on him like this until finally she intertwined her fingers and wraps it around his head and slams him to the ground, stomps his head with her feet, and overcomes the Egyptian. And Perpetua wakes up and she writes about this dream and she says, I knew then that when I went to when I went to the arena the next day that my fight would not be against the beasts, but against the devil himself. Chapter six. Now the day of her martyrdom has come, and they lead forth Perpetua and Felicitas, the two women and the other men who were catechumenates, uh, to be killed. They gave him, by the way, a last meal. And it says instead of celebrating some sort of great feast to the pagans, they celebrated the Christian love feast. Don't know what that means, but it's nice. Now they go to the arena and the men are brought out for first and they are given to all sorts of uh, wild animals. There's some various stories that happen in here. Uh, the leopards come out first and they're eating the guy. One guy is is 
receives a fatal wound by the leopard. Another man is mauled by the leopard, but not fatally. So they tie him to a bridge and they let the bear come out and maul him. Another man, they were trying something new apparently, and they tied him up to a boar. So the boar would gouge him and kill him. But instead of killing him, the boar went after the gladiator who was overseeing the stuff and ended up killing him. So they had to stab that man with a sword. But the writer of this account notes that they, they prepared a special indignity for Perpetua and Felicitas as women, that they had a mad cow to come and destroy them, to mock their femininity. Uh, they tried to dress them lewdly, but they wouldn't have it, so they go forth in robes, and this mad cow is let loose on these two women and mauls them. Mauls Perpetua, mauls Felicitas, but all the while, Perpetua is there comforting Felicitas, uh, embracing her, holding her up, lifting her up. And the account says that Perpetua, after the cow was done, didn't even know anything had happened. She wasn't feeling any pain. So that they would feel pain, the animals are put away, and the gladiator comes forth, and a young gladiator who was inexperienced with the sword, it says, cuts uh, Perpetua so that she would feel pain. So she shrieked in pain, but gathered herself together. In fact, in the whole midst of this, it tells us that uh, that Perpetual was more concerned with her modesty than she was with the pain, and that at one point uh, her hair came loose, and she finds a pin, and tie and puts her hair back up, fixes her hair, because the text tells us that uh, she didn't think it was right to be seen in mourning. You know, to have your hair down in mourning would not be appropriate, so she wanted to have her hair fixed. Well, finally, at the end, the gladiator runs a sword through her, uh, and she shrieks with pain, but gathers herself up together, and then he's going to go and, um, and kill her, and she gives her neck to the sword, and he applies the sword, and Perpetua, our sister, dies. Chapter 7 Now, I want to go back to the beginning of this story. As Perpetua was... Uh, first being arrested for saying she was a Christian. Her father came to her in the cell or whatever the room was to compel her, compel her to recant. And he says, don't you love, don't you love me, your father? Don't you love your mother? Don't you love your brothers? Look, don't you love your husband and your baby who's nursing? Just say Lord Caesar. You know, just, just offer this pinch of incense. It'll be fine, and you'll be able to live and live with us, with those who love you. And Perpetua says to her father, pointing at a jar that was in the corner, she says, Father, do you see that jar there? And he says, Yes. And she says, Can you call that thing by any other name than a jar? And he says, No. That's what it is. And so Perpetua says, you can call me by no other name than what I am. I am a Christian. I am a Christian. It's a fact. It's not something that a pinch of ancient sense can change. I can't lie about this. Just a make life easier I am a Christian and in that confession Perpetua teaches us also to bravely confess that we also are Christians no matter the cost if there's boars or leopards or swords wild feral cows waiting for us in an arena we are Christians if there's mockery or shame or rejection or hurt feelings or whatever, we are Christians. The Lord has called us his own. He's baptized us. He's given us his name. He's forgiven our sins. He's covered us with his blood. We are Christians. Thanks for listening to Martyr Monday. We'll talk to you next week. Do you see the rain there? It never rains like this in Colorado. This is great. And you can hear the thunder there, too. Hey, thank you guys for tuning in to Martyr Mondays. 
these have been really encouraging to me, uh, and I hope they have been to you as well. Uh, I've got a handful of martyrs lined up whose story I want to tell, but if you have some that you want to hear about, some ideas, uh, then please uh, feel free to post them in the suggestions below. And also, your help is, especially when you share these things, when you subscribe, uh, it, it helps you know, it helps these videos to be found by people who are looking for, hopefully, for some strength uh, as they themselves face persecution. We heard news this last weekend of 11, at least 11, who died in three different church bombings in Indonesia. And so the Martyr Monday hits home, uh, hits close to home this week. And so we always want to remember to pray for the persecuted church as well. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon.